Hello gang. Alright, today we're going to be talking about sampling distributions of sample means. So for the last two days in class we've been talking about sample proportions and how we would solve problems using sample proportions. Now we're going to move into sample means. So let's get started. You should have your notes in front of you. So consider the population, the length of fish in inches in my pond, consisting of the values 2, 7, 10, 11, and 14 inches. So I have five fish in my pond and these are the length in inches of all five, so that's the entire population. We could easily calculate the mean and the standard deviation of this population simply by adding them all up and dividing by five and then using the formulas for standard deviation to go about doing that. It's a small population, so we could certainly do that with no problems. So the population, the mean of our population is 8.8. .8. I simply added them all up and divided by five. And then the standard deviation of my population is 4.0694. Notice the symbols I'm using. Whenever I'm talking about a population, I use just a plain x. So the mean of the population, the standard deviation of the population, I use a plain x in both of those cases. Now, what if I were to take a bunch of samples of size 2 from this population? So the first question is, how many samples of size 2 are possible? Well, if I have five fish and I'm picking out two of them, then we learned previously that that would mean that I should do 5C2. Right? And if you use your calculator to do that, you can calculate it, and you would figure out that I have 10 possibilities. So I'm going to take, there's 10 different samples of size 2 that are possible, 5C2. Let's find all 10 of these samples and record the sample means. So imagine that I do that. So remember the size of my fish, I could take my two with the 5, or I could do the 2 with the 7, or I could do the 2 with the 10, or I could do the 2 with the 14, or I could do the 5 with the 7, and the 5 with the 10, and the 5 with the 14, and so on. All right? And I could list out all 10 of them, and I could calculate the mean of these two. So the mean of these two, 2 plus 7 divided by 2 is 3.5. So the mean here would be 3.5. The mean of these two would be 4.5. The mean of these two would be 6, and so on. I could calculate all of those means. And I could then go through, and I could take all of those means that I just canceled. So if I have 5C2, I calculate the mean and the standard deviation of all of those sample means, all 10 of them. I would wind up getting that the mean of all the sample means, so that's what this means down here at the bottom, u sub x bar it's the mean of the sample means is 8.8 .8. and the standard deviation of the sample means is 2.49 right, so you need to make sure you get that clear what I just did I took I have five fish I picked two of them there's ten different ways that I can do that so I went ahead and made a listing of all ten possibilities and I found the average of each of those ten and then I added those 10 averages together and divided by 10, and that gave me 8.8. .8. And then I did the same thing for the standard deviation. What if we were to repeat this procedure with sample size of n equals 3? Right, so if we did that, then we would have 5C3. And once again, there's 10 possibilities. Right, you can use your calculator to verify that, that 5C3 is equal to 10, so 10 possibilities. I can make a listing of all of those possibilities. So if I were to make a list of all those possibilities, I could have A, B, C, that could be together, or I could have A, C, D, I could have that together, or I could have A, B, D, or I could have A, B, E, and so on. I could make a list of all the possibilities, and there's ten of them. And if I were to average these, these all average these three, A, B, C, and get the average. Average these three, A, C, D, and get the average. Average A, C, A, B, D, and get the average. And average A, B, E, and get the average. And did that for all ten samples. And added them all up and divided by ten, that would give me the mean of all those samples. And then I could use all those samples that I just did and I could calculate the standard deviation. And what would happen is you would wind up getting if we were to find all these samples and record the means and then find the mean and the standard deviation of all those mu sub x bar is 8.8 .8. and the standard deviation of x bar is 1.66 so take a minute 
and think about what just happened. If I did this, the mean of the entire population, I got 8.8. .8. If I did the mean of all the samples of size 2, I got 8.8. .8. If I did the mean of all the samples of size 3, I got 8.8. .8. So every single time, no matter what size, the mean of the sampling distribution is the same. It's always 8.8, .8, which is the mean of the population. The thing that changed was the standard deviation. The standard deviation got smaller the bigger the samples. When it was the population, I had a, sample, a standard deviation of 2.9. With a sample size of 2, I had a sampling distribution of 2.2. .2, and now I have a sampling distribution, or a standard deviation of 1.66. So it's getting smaller each time. So hopefully you noticed that too, now that I kind of made it, made it clear to you. The mean of the sampling distribution is going to equal the mean of the population. Here's the formula you want to write down. Mu sub x bar equals mu. Then, as sample size increases, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution decreases. The bigger the sample size, the smaller the standard deviation. So as n goes up, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution goes down. Now we've seen this definition before and it's very important. So we've seen it like three times now. So hopefully you're getting the idea that this is very important. A statistic used to estimate a parameter is called unbiased if the mean of its sampling distribution is equal to the true value of the parameter being estimated. So if you can calculate the mean of the sampling distribution, all the different samples, and the mean of that sampling distribution is equal to the true value of the population parameter, we call that statistic unbiased. So general properties, two things to write down. Rule number one, mu sub x bar should equal the population parameter mu. Rule number two, the standard deviation of x bar is equal to the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n, where n is the sample size. So you want to write those two things down. You do want to know them. You need to know them. Now remember that just like in proportions, this rule, the standard deviation rule, is approximately correct as long as no more than 10% of the population is included in the sample. So you need to make sure that you consider that, that it only works if the sample is no more than 10% of the population. Otherwise, you can't use this rule. Rule number three, if the population distribution is normal, then the sampling distribution of x bar will also be normal for any sample size n. So in other words, if you start out normal, approximately normal, if the population starts out approximately normal, the sampling distribution will also be normal no matter what sample size you start with. So you want to make sure that you remember that. You always want to look for that in any problems we do. You want to look and see whether they're telling you what you're starting with. So this is what you want to remember for this picture, is this is your population. All right, so you have your population. And if they tell you that the population is normal, and we have some mean, they're giving you population parameter, of that. We're going to take a whole bunch of samples. So when we take all these samples, what we wind up getting is we wind up getting a whole bunch of x bars. And then if we added up all of those x bars and we took the average of them, we would find that the mean of all the x bars is equal to the population parameter. And since we started off normal, we would know that x bar also has a normal distribution, right? The normal distribution with a mu sub x bar comma the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Right? So you want to pay attention to that. A lot of times the problems will state we're starting off with a normal population, in which case we know it's a normal. The sampling distribution will also be normal, and if it's normal then we can use norm CDF to calculate all our probabilities. Now, 
I'm using the words if it's normal. You don't usually want to say that. You want to say if it's approximately normal because nothing is truly normal. It's all approximately normal. All right. So then, here's an example. Army reports that the distribution of head circumference among soldiers is approximately normal. So there's a key phrase, approximately normal, with a mean of 22.8 inches and a standard deviation of 1.1 inches. So things to remember. It's starting off. We know it's approximately normal. Here's a population parameter. Here's a population parameter. What's the prob probability that a randomly selected soldier's head will have a circumference that's greater than 23.5 inches? So this is for a single randomly selected soldier's head. So to do that, then, we can simply use norm CDF, because right, if you imagine what we have here, we have norm CDF. We want it to be greater than 23.5 inches. So we would have 23.5 inches would be our lower, 9999999 would be our upper, 22.8 would be the mean, and 1.1 would be the standard deviation. And if you did that, you should get that the probability that x is greater than 23.5 is 0.2623. Okay, now here's a variation. What's the probability that a random sample of five soldiers have a head circumference that's greater than 23.5 inches? Well, in this case, what normal curve are we working with now? Because what's changed? Right? Now that we have five soldiers instead of a single soldier, if we go back to the previous slide, we would find that the, remember that the mean that we started with was 22.8 inches and a standard deviation of 1.1. So that's our normal curve, 22.8, 1.1. However, now that we have five soldiers, things are going to change a little bit. The mean is not going to change, but the standard deviation is going to change. So now, the normal curve we're working with now is a normal curve, 22.8, comma, 1.1, divided by the square root of 5. Right? That's your new normal, that's your new standard deviation. It's no longer 1.1. So when we calculate this probability, we're going to want to use norm CDF greater than 23.5, so 23.5 is your lower, 9999999 is your upper, 22.8 is your mean, but then your standard deviation is no longer 1.1, now your standard deviation is this. And that's because we're now dealing with five soldiers instead of a single soldier. Okay, so if we can get my slide to work. So we're looking now for the probability that x bar, instead of just x, because we're dealing with a sample of five, we're dealing with an x bar, is greater than 23.5. And we can use this then in norm CF. Now, you should be able to get a good feel for this do you expect the probability to be more or less than the answer we got in part A? Well, in part A, we had a sample standard deviation of 1.1. Now, we have a standard deviation of less than 1.1. So it's much more tightly grouped than it was before. So therefore, it's much more unlikely to get five soldiers that all have a head this big, as opposed to a single soldier that has a head this big. So we're going to find the probability to be much smaller than it was previously. OK, here's another example. Suppose a team of biologists has been studying the Pinedale children's fishing pond. We're going to let x represent the length of a single trout taken at random from the pond. The group of biologists has determined that the length has a normal distribution of 10.2 and a standard deviation of 1.4. So we want to know, then, what's the probability that a single trout taken from this pond is between 8 and 12 inches long. Now once again keep in mind that what we're doing here is we're doing the probability of a single trout, right? Just a single trout. In this case what you're going to do is you're simply going to use norm CDF 8's your lower, 12's your upper, 10.2 is your standard deviation, and then 1.2, 10.2 is your mean, and 1.2 is your standard deviation. Right? So 1.4. Sorry. 
sorry, 1.4 is your standard deviation. So that's for a single trout, and notice that we have just a single x there. Right, now here's a follow-up question. What's the probability that the mean length of five trout taken at random is between 8 and 12 inches long? So now we're not dealing with a single trout, we're dealing with five trout. So our sample standard deviation is no longer 1.4. Our sample standard deviation is now going to be x bar 1.4 divided by the square root of 5. So our standard deviation is much smaller now than it was before. So when we write this then, we're going to want to write probability that x bar is between 8 and 12 is 0.9978, much bigger than it was before because this is much less spread out. Basically, it's asking, instead of a single trout, what's the probability that all five of the trout have a mean between there? And then what sample mean would be at the 95th percentile? So remember, in this case, we're being asked to find, instead of being asked to find a probability, we're being asked to find a number. In that case, we're not using norm CDF. We're using inverse norm. And the area is going to be 0.95 with a standard deviation of 1.4 divided by the square root of 5. And the mean is still 10.2. And if you do that, you get x bar equals 11.23. Okay, a soft drink bottler claims that on average cans contain 12 ounces of soda. We're going to let x denote the actual volume of soda in a randomly selected can. If x is normally distributed with a standard deviation of 0.16, 16 cans are randomly selected, and they have a mean of 12.1. Right? So the mean is 12.1 and the standard deviation is 0.16 and we're picking 16 cans. What's the probability that the mean of all 16 cans will exceed 12.1 ounces? Right? So this is the mean of the 16 cans are randomly selected and they have a mean of 12.1. What's the probability that the mean of the 16 cans will exceed 12.1. This should have been an x bar. All right, so in this case, we're using norm CDF. We want it to be 12.1. It will exceed 12.1. So 12.1, comma, 9999, comma, you know, so on, with a population mean of 12 and a standard deviation of 0.16 divided by the square root of 16. And that's how you would then go about getting the 0 0.0062 answer. Okay, and then if a population has any distribution. So the first couple of examples dealt with if we know if the population starts out approximately normal, then we know the sampling distribution is approximately normal. If the population has any distribution, in other words, we don't know if it's approximately normal. We can still do this because we may employ the central limit theorem. When n is large, the sample mean has that formula, and we can use the CLT, the central limit theorem, if n is greater than or equal to 30. So no matter what kind of distribution you start with, if your sample size is bigger than 30, the CLT allows us to use an approximately normal distribution to solve for the answers. So in this case, we're saying if our population is any shape, it's any shape. So even if it starts out where our population is heavily skewed in some direction, all right, so it's heavily skewed in some direction. If we take a whole bunch of x-bars, as long as n is greater than 30, so if our sample is greater than or equal to 30, the CLT tells us that our sampling distribution will be approximately normal. And therefore, we can use our formulas. 
mu sub x bar is going to equal to mu, right? assuming that n is greater than or equal to 30. Okay, so a hot dog manufacturer asserts that one of its brands of hot dogs has an average fat content of 18 grams per hot dog with a standard deviation of 18. Consumers of this brand would probably not be disturbed if the mean is less than 18, but would be unhappy if it exceeded 18. Because right, they don't want too much fat in there. An independent testing organization is asked to analyze a random sample of 36 hot dogs. Right, so n is 36. The resulting sample mean is 18.4 grams. What's the probability that the sample mean is greater than 18.4 grams? So in other words, what's the probability that this is really going to happen right, if we know that our mean starts off this way? So in this case, we don't know what the distribution started out looking like, but we do know that they're selecting 36 hot dogs. So if they're selecting 36 hot dogs, we can use the CLT and we know that we're going to wind up approximately normal. So we know that mu sub x bar is going to equal 18 and sigma sub x bar is going to equal 1 divided by the square root of 36 because that's our sample size. So based off of those two pieces of information we can then calculate our probability the probability that x is greater than or equal to 12.1 and this is this should be an x bar right, because it is based on the sample mean the greater than or equal to 12.1 is going to be 0 0.0082 so you should do that on your calculator just to make sure so what I did was greater than 12.1 I used norm CDF 12.1 is the lower 9999999999999 something big something really big for the upper with a average fat content of 18.1 or 18 and a standard deviation of 1 divided by the square root of 36 now I just realized I don't know where that 12.1 came from uh, they want to know what's the probability the sample is greater than 18.4 so you're probably wondering that as well that should not have been 12.1 that should have been 18.4 what's the probability the sample mean is greater than 18.4 so that's a typo on my part right, and if you do norm CDF on that you should get 0 0.0082 okay so did this result indicate the manufacturer's claim is correct and you can answer that for yourself. It is highly unlikely with that kind of a probability that the manufacturer's claim is correct. I mean, it's just not likely that 36 hot dogs would result that way. So we would basically be very suspicious about what was going on there. Okay, so thanks for listening. I hope you took some good notes and hopefully you have some good questions that you can ask me. And I would encourage you, if you do have any questions about the video, to go on to Edmodo and use this as an opportunity to make a comment. And I will see you tomorrow.